Good evening, comrades. Welcome to our latest session in our series, Why Marx? Tonight, uh, we're starting a sub-series where we're looking closer at some of the issues that we've raised previously. Um, so we started looking at some of the issues and now in, in an overall uh, attempt to, to give an overall overview. And now we are looking at some of these issues in more detail. So tonight we're very pleased to have with us Ian Spencer. We're going to start with a look at um, ideology because that is such a big issue that really covers a lot of things in society, how society is run, how we're being you know, fed the status quo, don't rock the boat, et cetera. Uh, that's such a big issue that we're starting to look at, having a look at that. Then we're turning to money, Marx and money, and then Marx in the political economy, then we're moving on to uh, religion, uh, hopefully war as well, and um, class consciousness, all sorts of other things before, uh, I think, end of July, we're getting to Marx and party building, which should be very interesting because that's really concretely what to do and how to organize, um, et cetera. So it's a lot of interesting, very interesting sessions coming up. If you are uh, an expert or want to be an expert or want to become an expert in, in, in any issue, please get in touch and you know, offer to prepare a session on, on a subsection on, on one issue of, of Marx that, that interests you and be very keen to, to hear your thoughts if you want to make a presentation. So now over to Ian for about 40, 45 minutes, perhaps, and then we can have a discussion and questions from the from the floor. Again, it, we're, you know, we're all friends here. If you have if you don't understand something in particular or don't quite get something or have just a, you know, a question of, of clarification, don't don't feel shy about it. Um, we're all friends here. We can we can ask any kind of questions or even you know, if you want to make a contribution, that's, of course, allowed as well. Uh, over to you, Ian. Thanks you for joining us. Evening, comrades. Uh, it's almost difficult to overstate how important the question of ideology is. Um, if you look at the situation we are currently in, um, why aren't people more furious? Why, why do we have a situation where, for example, people can stand on the street for Charles Windsor's magic hat party, um, but by contrast appear to be relatively muted when it comes to being on the brink of World War III? How is it that, for example, um, Marxists have, for uh, well over 100 years been trying to create a more humane society but we have seen of course utterly barbarous um, societies in the same period um, what is it about workers that will vote for brexit or think that nigel farage is a reasonable person the the, the peculiarities of the situation in which we find ourselves where on the one hand um arguably capitalism is coming towards its end it is in decline that doesn't mean to say it's going to collapse tomorrow but it is in decline but on the other hand the difficulty of actually creating a new socialist society in which people would become truly human for the first time in history written history at least um is uh, a difficult one to fathom and of course we have had we have to look at the fact that we have faced defeat after defeat over the last century and a half so Marx and ideology are crucially important the other thing of course about it is is that typically what happens when it comes to Marx and ideology people pick up on one particular quote which we'll discuss in a moment and say, well, look, here we are, here's Marx, and he's putting forward an a, a, a economic determinist perspective, which clearly doesn't account for this, that, or the other. And, of course, in the way in which people set it up as a kind of straw man, of course, it doesn't and can't explain those things. Um, but as we'll go on to see, I think it is precisely the straw man Marxism uh, that we need to demolish here and in the hope of having a resurrection, if I can use that term, of Marxist thought. 
because now is the time. Uh, we stand on the brink of horrific war, of societies which have been reduced um, to wastelands uh, across the world, and the ruling class simply can't deal with it, doesn't have a strategy. Capitalism has outlived its usefulness. And yet, if you like, the the the, the thought, the, the 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 analysis of what's happening is lagging very far behind what it needs to be in order to uh, create the possibility of a new society. Um, as is often the case, uh, I uh, have a tendency to sort of look for a hook to hang something on when I'm preparing to, to talk. Um, in this case, I've, I've hung the, on, on the peg of Franz Jakubowski, um, his little book, Ideology and Superstructure in Historical Materialism, is its only real contribution to Marxist theory, but it is nevertheless a very readable uh, piece of work if you want to uh, look at some of the, the important points that, that are being raised here. Uh, Jakubowski was born in what is now Poznan, Poland, was then in Prussia. He studied law between 1930 and 33. And he's one of what has come to be known sometimes rather derisively <laughs> as part of a Western Marxist tradition. Now, I would suggest that that period where we're looking at the, the defeat of the German Revolution and subsequently the defeat, of course, of the, the Russian Revolution is a, is a period in which people tried in various ways to come to terms with what was going on. Precisely for the things I've been saying, you know, why was it that people could unite behind a clearly opportunist social democratic party, not just in Germany, but the Labour Party in Britain or anywhere else? So uh, Jakubowski was influenced by Karl Kors, uh, who wrote Marxism and Philosophy, among many other things. And of course, George Lukács, uh, in particularly his early works, History and Class Consciousness, and later on, in this series, we'll be looking at the question of class consciousness. Jakubowski, um, like Korsh, like Lukács, was really trying to rescue the humanist basis of Marx. And we don't tend to use the term humanist in relation to Marx because we tend to think of an abstract humanism. And that's just the point. Um, the, the, the necessity to rescue the kind of humanist basis of Marxism uh, it was actually put forward really by, uh, so Jakubowski was influenced by a number of people in the, the, the Frankfurt School among, as I say, Korsh and Lukács. And it's an attempt to rescue the, the, the ontological project of Marx about how it is about becoming truly human for the first time. And the other point about it, of course, is that until the publication of the Grundrisse, in, at least in, an, in, in the English-speaking world, um, the, the tendency was to regard dialectics as just some kind of slightly awkward add-on, something that is a, a, a bit of source or something, or just a, a, a frippery. And of course, many other Marxist writers um, at, at the time when, for example, Lenin was writing, were themselves trying to do away with um, Hegel and, and the importance of Hegel to Marxist thought. And I would argue here that an understanding of ideology means that we have to get to grips with the dialectical perspective of, of Marx and, and the huge debt that he owed to George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Um, Jakubowski himself uh, was politically active until 1933 and then escaped to the USA. He subsequently changed his name to Frank Fisher, and, and not much has been heard of him ever since, and he died in, in 1970. So uh, this is not a, 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 a resounding defense of the works of Franz Jakubowski. This is just the, the hook that I hung it on, and a suggestion that it's quite a useful thing to read if you want to get to grips with some of the debates around Marx and, uh, and, and ideology and superstructure and historical materialism, because I think we need to go beyond um, what we might call uh, the, the base and superstructure metaphor, which we'll come back to. So what the hell do we mean by ideology in, in the first place? Um, the word, of course, 
Ideologie, uh, coined by, what a great name, Antoine Louis Claude Destu Comte de Tracy, um, and those are his dates. Uh, the, the way uh, de Tracy used ideology um, was really to argue for a, a science of thinking, a science of ideas, as it were. Um, uh, he gets the award for the person who came up with the word, but of course this is very different from what Marx was talking about and very different from how it is in common parlance. I throw it in here really just to talk about the way in which um, the meanings of words makes a difference and changes over time. Um, as de Tracy was talking about it, you, you, ideology might be more easily identified as a psychology you know the way in which people think and of course in in so doing he was talking about the way in which people think uh, as a, a human organism from that point of view it represents a kind of advance uh for its time but nevertheless has long been su since the past and i don't think very many people read him today the page of, of scrawly handwriting you see is the first page of Marx's Marx and Engels uh, book, uh, The German Ideology, which, as many of you will know, was, as he put it, um, consigned to the gnawing criticism of the mice. Uh, it was something written uh, mostly in Engels' hand, in fact, uh, which was far more legible, um, but written by Marx, Engels, also um, Moses Hess contributed some and, and others. Um, but it was a, a series of notes, a, a series of things that, that were written largely for, where the original intention was to publish, but, but it was abandoned to the gnawing criticism of the mice, largely because it was written for self-clarification. It was Marx and Engels in particular coming to terms with um, the debates that they'd been having with the young Hegelians, such as Bruno Bauer and Max Stirner and so on. But what it's famous for, particularly part one, uh, is an outline of the materialist conception of history. And the, the German ideology itself was unpublished until 1932. Um, I also wanted to just throw in about how the, the word ideology here is being used as opposed to in common parlance. I mean, we sometimes we'll talk today about the, imagine the ideology of the Conservative Party or some such. And what we mean is a kind of set of ideas around a political organisation or a um, but that's not really what is going on with Marx. He's coming to terms with the transition um, from the, the philosophical idealism of Hegel uh, and not only setting Hegel on his feet uh, and rescuing, as he put it, uh, the rational kernel inside the mystical shell of, of Hegelianism, but doing more, rescuing the radical and insightful uh, basis of, of, of Hegel's work in an effort to arrive at, a, a, if you like, a, a, a science of the transformation of society. Um, before I go any further, perhaps it might be just worth talking about a little bit about materialism versus idealism, if people are unfamiliar with it at all. Um, uh, uh, another bearded German gentleman this is Max Weber, who between 1904 and 1905 wrote The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, much beloved of sociology lecturers everywhere. And of course, um, Max Weber was hugely influential on sociology and is often used as a kind of uh, stick with which to beat Marx with. The, the suggestion is that somehow he offered a, a, a more uh, subtle uh, discussion or around the question of history and uh, and politics and class in particular. Uh, what I've argued in another place is that, in fact, sociology grows up in opposition to Marxism. And the reason why I used him here, just to kind of illustrate a point, is not because he was a, a good example of idealist philosophy, but he was a good example about how his understanding of history was in many ways, I would argue, inferior to that of Marx and Engels. So let's contrast, for example, the discussion of um, the Reformation, the, 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 the Protestant Reformation uh, throughout Europe uh, in, in the 16th century, and 
counterpose Friedrich Engel's excellent and very readable uh, book, The Peasant War in Germany, which was written in 1850 and concerning events taking place between 1524, 1525, and was actually the biggest single up, uh, uprising of peasants until the French Revolution. Uh, this was an extraordinary uh, period in, in, in history. Um, Thomas Munzer uh, was, uh, in a sense, a, a follower of, of, of Martin Luther, but went far beyond Martin Luther, uh, was critical of Martin Luther's um, <laughs> tendency to go easy, as it were, on the riches of the church and the riches of the wealthy and the fact that uh, Martin Luther uh, would not support any kind of uh, demand for a, a transformation of, of the, the poverty of the poor peasantry in Germany at the time. Well, the reason why I mention this is to counterpose it with Max Weber. If you read the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, um, what you see is, here is Weber arguing that it's the ideas of the Reformation, um, the notion of uh, working one's worldly calling instead of um, going to church and going to confession and, and above all, of course, um, paying money to the church for the salvation of one's soul. So he's arguing that the, the fact that success in one's worldly calling becomes a sign of the possibility of having of grace that you you are not one not you are one of the elect that you may well go to heaven because after all you have been successful in your worldly calling and on that basis uh, you receive some kind of relief from the anxiety of a possibility of eternal damnation. So here, um, Weber is using the ideas of Protestantism to suggest that it is those ideas that bring capitalism into being. So although if he was here with me today, he would be so old he could only mumble, but if he were to be able to argue, he would argue that uh, it was more sophisticated than that, but it's hard to escape the, the, the argument that what, what Weber was putting forward was that the ideas of capitalism bring capitalism into being. By contrast, um, if, if one reads Frederick Engels' discussion of the Reformation at this time, Thomas Munzer is, is placed very firmly in that historical context. It, it shows about how the, the way in which the ideas of Munzer uh, were um, engaging with, with one, and it was a, Engels' method, uh, Marx and Engels' method was being used to elucidate the way in which Thomas Munzer's um, activities were engaged with the, the, the political and, and economic repression suffered by the poor peasantry in Germany at the time. From that point of view, you can sort of see the way in which Marx and Engels' method takes account of the, of the, of the material conditions of the time, uh, of the exploitation of the peasantry, but also the ideas that are being thrown up at the time, ideas that are being thrown up by those concrete material circumstances faced by the peasantry in Germany at the time. And so what we then see is a, a very materialist appreciation of the importance of the Reformation taking place. And we can counterpose that uh, with Weber's turgid little work uh, and, and show the way in which that, the, the method of Marx and Engels takes account of ideas in, in a way which is often caricatured um, by anti-Marxists and particularly sociologists. And the reason why I've also, by the way, thrown in Weber here is because Franz Jakubowski himself was, like a lot in the, uh, they were influenced and in, around the Frankfurt School at the time, heavily influenced by Weber because it, it, they were looking for explanations for, for um, why the revolutions had failed. Uh, but I would argue that they were looking in the wrong place. Um, as you know, uh, along the way, uh, as Marx and Engels developed their critique of Hegel. Um, one of the great contributions was that of uh, Ludwig Feuerbach. Um, for Feuerbach, uh, in his Essence of Christianity, uh, he's effectively, he is standing Hegel on his feet, as it were. He's arguing that um, Christianity is coming, coming 
uh, it, it effectively that it's humanity that creates Christianity. It's humanity that creates religion. It's the ideas again uh, that spring from human beings create religious ideas as an abstraction. And of course, if we go back to looking at uh, the peasant war in Germany, Thomas Münzer's political ideas were expressed in religious terms because all ideas were expressed in religious terms in the 16th century. And uh, from that point of view, it's highly pertinent to our understanding of, of ideology and what Marx and Engels meant by ideology. But as you know, uh, Marx was very critical of, of Feuerbach. Uh, at one point, Engels said that the, the, uh, the, the advance that Feuerbach had made um, meant that then we were all Feuerbachians. But of course, Marx and Engels quickly surpassed uh, Feuerbach. And so that by the time you get to uh, the, the theses on the various theses on Feuerbach, uh, you get the in thesis number four, Feuerbach resolves the religious essence into the human essence. But the human essence is no abstraction inherent in each single individual. It is in reality the ensemble of human relations. So here we are. Um, Marx is starting to state the relationship between the world around us and ideology. The, it, in its reality, it is the ensemble of human relations. The human essence in its reality is the ensemble of social relations. Humans are social. It is part of what it is to be a human being. We could not exist as individuals. Um, Marx goes on later to criticize further uh, Feuerbach. To the extent that Feuerbach is a materialist, history does not occur to him. To the extent that he takes history into consideration, he's no materialist. But the point is that what Feuerbach is presenting is really something which is also quite congruent with what we see in bourgeois sociology. The idea of uh, the human abstracted as a series of individuals, as a series of disconnected individuals who are, who are ironically, uh, it, shaped by the society around them, but in a way in which they have no control over. Um, of course, the uh, final uh, thesis on Feuerbach is, of, is, of course, that philosophers have only uh, interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Marx and Engels were lifelong followers and critics of, of Hegel, and critic in this sense uh, it, it means somebody who also fulsomely appreciates their work. Uh, famously, um, in, in writing volume one of Capital, um, Marx went back to reading uh, Hegel's uh, logic. Uh, and so he did far more than just simply set Hegel on his feet. It wasn't simply a, an inversion of Hegel. It wasn't simply a case of, uh, well, we'll if, we, if we give this a kind of materialist spin, that somehow uh, that, that will set all to rights. That's, that's all that effectively Feuerbach did. Um, instead, so in other words, Marx didn't, for example, have a notion around, where, whereas for Hegel, the world is a realization of the absolute idea. And of course, ultimately, I suppose that would have to resolve to be God. Uh, for, for Marx, there was no corresponding absolute matter or absolute human. Uh, indeed, uh, for, for Marx and Engels, the human is real, social, and above social and historical. Uh, being a human uh, it is dependent upon uh, the interconnectedness of, of human activity, uh, the way in which we um, come to be truly human is only in society. So we have a unity, uh, and it doesn't mean it's the same thing. It's not a, 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 a unity of consciousness and being. Uh, the, uh, the, the consciousness, our subject, uh, the, the subjectivity, if you like, and being the object. Um, so, uh, it, and of course, this is best expressed in uh, the Paris manuscripts of 1844, the economic and philosophic manuscripts. Um, and this brings us to the one quote that, of course, tends to be reproduced and tends to be used to help set up the straw man of, uh, of Marx uh, and the, the famous kind of base and superstructure metaphor. And I, I make no apologies for reading it out. It's, uh, I think it's very important because um, I, in the social production of their life, people enter into particular necessary relations independently of their will. 
relations of production which correspond to a particular stage of development of their material productive forces. These productive relations as a whole form the economic structure of society. The real base upon which a legal and political superstructure rises and to which particular forms of social consciousness correspond. The mode of production of material life conditions the social, political and mental life processes in general. It is not the consciousness of men that determine their being, but on the contrary, their social being that determines their consciousness. Okay. Apart from the fact that it's beautifully written, um, the, the importance here, I mean, just look at some of the, the various, People enter particular necessary relations independently of their will. A worker's got no choice. To, to, I mean, a, a worker under capitalism enters supposedly freely into a labor contract, but it doesn't have a choice not to. And of course, that's very different from slavery and far better than slavery. But nevertheless, uh, whilst it leaves a person free to a certain extent, it leaves them also free to starve. It's a necessary relation. Relations of production which correspond to a particular stage of development of their material productive forces. It's not really just a question of, of economics as it's usually caricatured. It's all the factors that, that go hand in hand with it, including natural ones, by the way. I mean, given that the two greatest threats we currently face are, on the one hand, the possibility, a real possibility of World War Three, and on the other hand, the worldwide physical degradation of the environment. Um, Marx here is taking account of those natural things, biology, geography, climate, and so on, and incorporating all of those in this kind of, the, the stage of development of material productive forces. It's not, so it's not, in other words, not just a case of the bourgeoisie owns everything and we have nothing else to sell but our labor power and that gives rise to everything it's a crucial part but nevertheless it's all of that the mode of production material conditions the social and political mental life process in general um so this is the bit that's used to kind of create that straw man of, of marxism uh, but it's very important to 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 put that in the context of of everything else he wrote. Uh, as you know, um, Marx and Engels didn't sit down. And Engels says in a, in a letter at one point, in, in a way, he's sorry he didn't, they didn't sit down and write out a systematic discussion about the, the, this question. Um, but, and so one is left to um, garner it by study of the various works. The most important thing I would suggest is, of course, in looking at capital. Uh, the whole area of commodity fetishism. Commodity fetishism is crucially important. Uh, if you read very early on, at uh, one point in, in Capital, um, Marx says, you know, the, the problem is already solved. He, he realises that this, the way in which um, capitalism is organised, the way in which commodities are produced, means that relations between people, are as relations between things. They assume a kind of contractual relationship between objects. At the same time, the products of human labor um, rise up over human labor and dominate it. So workers working in a factory um, don't experience a machine as something which makes their labor um, more productive. They experience it, it makes it mind crushingly boring and turns them into little more than a, a, a component of the machine. Um, so commodity fetishism is about the fact that, for example, a commodity appears to have value in much the same way that you know, it has weight or color or um, a particular sound when you hit it with a hammer. Um, these appear to be, the, the fact that it has value appears to be a natural relationship. Um, the other point about alienation, of course, in terms of uh, the, the, the sale of one's labor power, we as subjects become objects and uh, we, we have no other choice but to sell, to sell ourselves. And, and as such, we become separated from what it is to be truly human. Relations between humans become contractual relations between things. So even the most intimate relationships take a contractual form. Um, similarly, uh, 
things which are, are social features. Uh, here I'm not talking about the kind of typical way that sociologists will talk about social construction, um, but the, things which are, are, are social relations become reified, they appear to become like natural features, whether it's hierarchy or whether it's uh, systems of domination uh, or, or even notions such as the inherent greediness of people. For example, one sees this in the writings of Thomas Hobbes um, expressing beautifully uh, the, the nature of capitalism in the sense that he's arguing that without the state, Life becomes solitary, poor, and nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, so the state then becomes a necessary feature; it becomes a natural feature. Here is, a, you know, what we're looking at is a a, a reification of 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 things which are um, social features, social features between people. Um, things are commodities because that is a social relationship money is a social relationship but it appears to have its power just in, in just a, a natural feature because it has the queen's or now king's head on it which then brings us on to the thorny question of false consciousness um one of the features of um the caricature of, of Marx and Engels is that somehow false consciousness means that, well, workers simply aren't capable of understanding it. And as we'll see later, um, this is part of a discussion which, in which, for example, um, Hans Jakubowski is somewhat critical of Lenin in suggesting that somehow that it is uh, the, the, the class consciousness, the most advanced vanguard uh, of the working class that brings the consciousness of, uh, of the nature of capitalism to the working class. So consciousness then, um, consciousness is a, a, as much a part of um, that superstructure as anything else, but uh, it's not that it is simply a passive relationship. At one point, um, Marx and Engels talk about the fact that ideas themselves become a material force um, uh, when they take hold of the masses. Um, they... Uh, th what we see is a, in, in, in the movement in history is that it is, as Marx and Engels put it in the 18th, as Marx put it in the 18th Premier, men make history, but not just as they please. Uh, they do it under the particular circumstances which they, they find themselves in. Another thing I want to draw attention to, really, in the work of Marx and Engels, is the relationship between appearance and essence. Marx was a thoroughgoing essentialist. Now, of course, that makes some people bristle because we tend to think of, the, again, a caricature of essentialism uh, as, as the sort of thing that for feminists quite rightly uh, are, are, are critical of. But that's not the essentialism of Marx. For Marx, um, the appearance and essence of things don't necessarily correspond. Uh, one has to go dig a little deeper. Uh, it isn't obvious uh, that money is a social relationship. One has, to, one has to employ a scientific method in order to make that apparent. So the appearance and the essence of things, Marx at one point says if the essence of things coincided with its uh, appearance, then all science would be superfluous. Um, you see, unlike Hume or other philosophers who would tend to argue for a, a kind of sceptical position that we have to prove everything empirically every single day, what Marx is arguing is that we, the, the task of science is to uncover the inner essence of things. So whether it's money, whether it's class relations, whether it's um, a, a political formation, uh, that's, that's the task of, of, of science. And of course, it's our laboratory, as it were, is in political action, in political activity. Um, the other point uh, I want to draw attention to is this question around accident and necessity in history. If we go back, for example, to looking at uh, the Reformation or the English Revolution or the Peasant War in Germany, we can see that uh, feudalism was in decline for a long time before it was finally overthrown. The decapitation of Charles I um, was, in a sense, the sweeping away of the last feudal impediments to capital accumulation um, but it had been a long process that just as the decline of the Roman Empire had taken uh, centuries so indeed the decline of uh, feudalism had taken uh, hundreds of years too uh, and was finally swept away 
um, what we see is a, a, a necessary development in history. Once, for example, uh, primitive accumulation starts to take place and the, the, the world moves to a, a worldwide market, then the bourgeoisie comes into being. Instead of being a feudal uh, landowning uh, class which has unfree labor serfs, it quickly transforms that land into pasture to for the wool trade, which is where Thomas Moore talked about sheep eating men. Um, so that um, the production then becomes purely for the market and you end up with a kind of capitalist agriculture before you have fully, fully developed capitalism. So it's an interesting way of seeing the way in which things develop because of course Marx famously understood that uh, the, the, the socialism is growing as it were within the womb of capitalism. The capitalism brings into being the means of its own supersession. And of course, accident and necessity in history uh, has to be taken into account. You know, who knows what would have happened if um, uh, James Connolly had not thrown in his lot with nationalists and got killed in 1916 in Dublin. What if he'd done it a year later, after the February Revolution and, and, and as a, maybe as a spur to, to, to world revolution? We don't know. What would have happened if uh, uh, the German Social Democratic Party had refused to vote for the, the, the Kaiser's war credits? We don't know it's speculative history, but nevertheless, accident and necessity are in, interpenetrating poles in historical development. And above all, that historical development is carried out by people, uh, not just as they please, but nevertheless, actively in changing society. And in so changing in society, they change themselves. Um, nature and human agency are intimately bound up. There is hardly a a uh, square foot, I would dare uh, think, of, of Germany or or or, uh, or Britain uh, that hasn't had human activity shaping it, and and similarly we have shaped our very selves. Marx in Dialectics of Nature, uh, Engels in Dialectics of Nature talks about the way in which grasping tools have shaped the human hand. We could go further and look at the way in which um, the ability to cook food. Uh, has, has allowed us to develop a, a much larger brain. So ideas are a, a material force in changing things and nature is intimately bound up with human agency. Um, when I was talking about the kind of straw man of Marxism, as it were, um, Jakubowski is somewhat critical of, of Lenin, of Plekhanov, of Kautsky, and indeed of Luxembourg, but for different reasons. Um, it's it's worth engaging with the debate. Um, I would personally argue, for example, that uh, the discussion around Lenin's book, uh, Materialism and Imperial Criticism, has to be seen in a particular context. I mean, bearing in mind, Lenin wrote this between uh, 1908 and 1909, when he was on the run. Partly it was written in Geneva, partly in London, partly in Paris, I think. And and was was written largely as a, a as a riposte to people like Bogdanov, who were trying to effectively then do away with dialectics in um, in, in Marxism, uh, in in favour of a, a, a positivist approach to science within Marxism, a positivist approach to the science to science in society. Um, and it was Lenin engaged in a polemical debate with Bogdanov rather than himself deciding to write a textbook on uh, Marxist philosophy. The fact that it was used as a textbook for Marxist philosophy is an interesting illustration of a point we've been trying to make. That is to say, um, Lenin didn't intend it to be a, a, a definitive statement of, of Marxist philosophy, but, it was, but parts of it were used in, effectively to frame a kind of mechanistic form or a mechanistic interpretation of Marxism as a means to further the interests of Stalinists within the Third International. Um, it certainly wasn't the way in which it was intended. Um, there is a, a question around whether um, Lenin's use of, of ideology as a reflection of the, of, the, of, the, of the economic base, as it were, 
can be seen as to be a kind of origin of the mechanistic materialism, uh, which he inherited from Plekhanov via Kautsky as part of the, um, the, 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 the criticism of, of, of second international Marxism. Um, I, I, you know, <laughs> maybe, and it's and it's an interesting discussion. I don't think there's anything in Lenin really that suggests that uh, that Lenin thought it was inevitable that that revolution would take place. The things that Jakubowski is 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 arguing against here is the idea, for example, that you could ever just sit back and wait for revolution to happen, to wait for the necessity in history to deliver the right conditions for revolution to take place. Jakubowski like Marx, like Engels, like Lenin, is absolutely adamant that that can only take place in a revolutionary situation. Indeed, the development of Marxist ideas, the implication is very clear, can only really take place with engagement in revolution, revolutionary practice. Um, so materialism and empiricism is used as a textbook, but one can also argue that Western, so-called Western Marxism, of which Franz Jakubowski was a part of, uh, was an attempt to deal with the defeat that it had faced and uh, tended to take up some of the ideas, for example, of Max Weber, uh, often with little justification, but nevertheless, it was at least an attempt to rescue the, the humanist uh, and ontological um, project of, of Marx uh, and, and rescue the Hegelian tradition, which is firmly rooted in Marx's work. So class consciousness then, uh, is also a part of what we might regard as ideology. And uh, the question is about whether it is the spontane spontaneity, for example, that was being put forward by Rosa Luxemburg, or whether it was transplanted from without by Lenin. Again, one can argue that those are possibly caricatures of uh, what was actually taking place. The importance here, and uh, I'll finish on this, is that class struggle and socioeconomic foundations have to be understood historically as relations between people and uh, relations between classes because people don't exist on their own. They cannot exist on their own. Um, uh, Robinson Crusoe only exists as a book because it is weird, odd. Humans can't exist on their own. Uh, human, there's rare occasions when humans have been raised by animals where they never achieve uh, full humanity. Um, yeah, the importance here uh, in terms of the, the task of Marxists is to bring to bear uh, the lessons that need to be learned by us as communists within the proletariat, not separate from, as in an integral part of it, I'm, I've never been anything other than a wage slave, uh, about the historical and transitory nature of, of capitalism, and moreover, that us as proletarians are its natural grave digger. The proletariat in that sense is unique you know, compared to all other classes that have eventually taken power. And the transition from um, the ancient world to, to, to feudalism, from feudalism to capitalism, uh, each new class uh, has taken power uh, for itself, as it were. The aim of the proletariat is unique. Its rule ends all classes. Uh, and the dictatorship of the proletariat is used to create the socialized conditions uh, for that to take place. And finally, I'll leave you then with a little quote from the German ideology by Marx. For the production on a mass scale of this communist consciousness, the transformation of men on a mass scale is necessary, and this can only take place in a practical movement, a revolution. Thank you, comrades. Excellent. Thank you very much, comrade. Um, thank you for that overview of various issues that have to do with the with the question of ideology it's clearly not just a single issue and I, I i hear what you're saying about the um simplistic way the space superstructure it's often been presented though i would like to ask you a couple of questions about that um in a minute comrades if you have any questions if you would like to make a contribution please click raise hand under reactions and i can make you a panelist if you'd like to come in without having your camera shown, you can just keep it off, uh, then your, your face will, won't be on screen. Um, so uh, firstly, that was something in the that's come up in the chat, which is the question of Brexit. And I think you um, <clears throat> used Brexit, the vote in fa favor of the small majority as a, you know, 
showing that ideology did its job and convinced the majority of the working class, etc. Wouldn't you say though that the other side as well, you know, the the side that came out for EU, uh, you know, the big butcher as opposed to the smaller butcher. I mean, that was certainly a reflection. That vote was a reflection of of for that side was uh, you know the ruling class ideology too, wasn't it? It was it was a capitalist class split actually. And both sides, perhaps, if you want, of the working class, or or on both sides, the working class was lured by promises, by you know, this is you know, this one is bad. Now this is this is much better, etc. But in fact, there should have been a third option, you know, a positive view of an international working class movement, true internationalism, rather than us having to end up picking two, basically two sides of the of the same coin. Isn't that isn't wasn't that a reflection of ideology in action as well? Absolutely. I mean, I, the other thing is, um, I've seen an awful lot of things about why people voted the way they did. Um, for the record, I voted to remain in because I want to see the end of all nation states. And uh, one can't pretend for one moment that the European Union is a, a means by which uh, there will be the eradication of, of the nation state in favour of, of a truly worldwide humanity. Um, and in fact, you know, if you look at the people who took the kind of Lexit position, People like Tarek Ali, I couldn't believe it, um, uh, took a view that somehow, um, well, there was two aspects to it. There, there, there was the Stalinist one, which was that if only, you know, we had more control or that a, a Corbyn-led government would, would suddenly be able to then make decisions for us, uh, ignoring what the Westminster government has done for us. <laughs> over hundreds of years um so there was the stalinist kind of position which was a which has always been there you know even when i was a 13 year old in the ycl uh the, the communist party of the time was opposed to membership of the then common market but then again i look at other people like my brother who's a builder in london and you know the, the his hostility to the european union wasn't on the basis of racism. He didn't dislike Poles. He doesn't dislike black people. He, he just was aware that he was having to compete in a marketplace with other people. Um, it's not that if he wasn't anyway. So part of it was actually there were quite rational reasons for some people voting uh, to leave. And there were quite irrational ones as well. Um, the task I would argue of, of Marxists under those circumstances is to bring precisely those kinds of contradictions out in the open and, and argue as it were I mean in a sense although it, it is itself dated Trotsky's uh, slogan for a united socialist uh, states of Europe was, was quite would have been quite pertinent uh, and, and and was certainly the kind of position I would have taken in any kind of discussion um, mm -hmm. that's what we should be arguing for a socialist united states of Europe even if we have to accept that that's in itself a little bit dated because what we ultimately want it's a, it's a socialist world. Um, mm. And you couldn't have socialism in one country, even if it was the size of the European Union. So, and in the meantime, I think as sort of, you know, we've been discussing the internationals in the last few weeks, and clearly there's a such a gap in the market, you know, for, for socialists to get together and start organizing, especially with the World War Three on the horizon. That seems a long overdue that, you know, we should have made a progress on that on that front or not. You know the the Lexit idea. I, I struggled with that massively, but uh, apparently, you know, that's that's we don't believe that's coming anymore. Uh, you know, I'm told that's that sort of that didn't happen for some. I, I think some people even voted uh, to, to leave the European Union purely on the on the on a kind of on the grounds that were, if this is going to annoy the ruling class yeah. a lot, <laughs> I'm going to vote to leave. Yeah. Uh, completely wrong headed in my view. But nevertheless, I don't think it was entirely irrational, and I don't think, and it's a it's a mistake to caricature everybody who was who voted for Brexit as a racist. No, or absolutely, no. I think, and you know, some people put it in the chat as well. There was, there was certainly, um, there was some a touch of the the idea that unions, um, union leaders were, you know, arguing that well, they're undercutting our wages, etc., immigrants and. And clearly the answer is you fight for a united international union movement rather than allow people to have their wages undercut, etc. But this is, I mean, yeah. this is the, the, the terrible 
paradoxes that we have to uh, expose really is that whilst on the one hand, the bourgeoisie is in a sense internationalist, on the other hand, uh, the working class is, is still largely nationalist in, in, in its outlook. I don't mean nationalist in a, in a committed political sense, but still tied to the idea of the nation state. The nation state for at least part of the bourgeoisie is now has outlived its purpose. But as you've rightly pointed out, there was of course a split in the bourgeoisie and that split between finance capital as a parasite on, um, on industrial capital uh, was, was hugely powerful. I mean, the, the, the dependence upon American finance capital and the extent to which the con conservative party has got investments in American finance capital is, is enormous. Indeed. Um, can we turn to the um, base superstructure model then, which I'm just going to quickly share on screen, because I quite like it. <laughs> and I'd like to talk to you about your sort of, maybe not your objections or the objections that you that you see um, or that had have been raised, because I'm not not quite privy to them. Are they on the screen now? Can you see them? Can yes. you see the graphic? Okay. So, I mean, this is, this is one of very many... Um, reflections sim symbol symbolically uh, represented by you know socialists or whatever when they're studying this kind of stuff in you know in universities when you're studying marxism you'll you look at that kind of thing as well but you know it helped me a lot to 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 learn about the role of ideology or what ideology might even be and how it works and it it kind of i think it does hold up to to quite a, a large degree although it, it you know it can be seen quite mechanically etc but this, you know, as as it shown, shows at the base the, the 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 way we produce things. You know how it's produced. There's there's the base, the the, the means of production. There's the, the the workers, and they are within this base, and how how it's organized. The means of production, relations of production, both of them. They then shape and maintain and create. You know, it's, I think it 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 it, it lacked here. Create it creates the superstructure. It creates the laws, it creates the laws it needs to keep that base, to keep the the way things are being produced, you know, out of out of our control. You know, we're mainly say labor power, we have to sell our labor power, etc. It keeps, you know, the media is there to keep that as it is, keep things as it are, politics, science, education. I mean, education is huge, um, huge role in ideology, family art, etc. And then this again, this the superstructure that shapes and maintains the base. I mean, it is quite simplistic, but I think it, it still kind of, you know, in my simplistic mind, it it still quite works quite well to explain to people what's what's happening and why the media is the way it is and why appeals to, you know, oh, the, the newspaper shouldn't write things like that. What's their job? That's what they're there for. You know, they're not going to, the Guardian is not going to come over on our side. You know, it's not going to happen. We need our own media, et cetera. So what, what, what then to, to get concretely, you know, back to what, what, what issues do you see with that, with this depiction here? Um, as it stands, nothing except, uh, though all I would add is, is the way in which, um, the the way in which the social relations become transparent at particular times i think the the, the notion around um the, the revolutionary moments happen at particular times and often for particular reasons and we've had examples of that with the first world war that kind of thing and who knows the next world war will make things more transparent again for those of us who stay alive um but all sorts of ways in, in which social relations which have been obfuscated become transparent and that can often be by the development for example of means and relations of production so from that point of view it's a perfectly good model but it, it what i it's 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 the way that sometimes things go in and out of transparency the way in which uh, you know if we take something like religion um why do we get monotheism developing at a particular time? Arguably because you've got trade and trade within particular religious groups may well be being expressed. And trade, of course, gives you what? A, uh, a notion of a, of a universality of humans, um, a universality of humans which precedes uh, even 
um, abstract labor uh, and the notion that we then all become commensurable with one another's labor all human beings become commensurable with one another and it's a feature of capitalism but monotheism predates it now, i'm not suggesting that monotheism has created capitalism but it's ideally suited as an ideological form and similarly, I mean, other monotheistic religions were also bound up with it. I mean, the, the, the development of Islam seems closely related to the development of, uh, of, a, of a competing market style economy within the Far East, the Middle East, rather. And perhaps this, this kind of model also doesn't show that all we are within the superstructures. These are all battlegrounds as well, isn't it, between the different mm -hmm. classes? I mean, there are where the classes clash, where we where we fight over, as well as on the base as well. But this looks, looks quite neat, does it? Quite, it goes round and round and round, whereas in fact it is a... And the other thing is about class struggle is it exerts an influence in even when it's not visible. Uh, I think that's the other important thing. that On a, every single day, a class struggle is going on, whether we, whether we are, you know, we've recently seen a wave of strikes, but without strikes, there would still be a, a class struggle exerting an influence, even if it's just people deciding to work badly. People mm -hmm. deciding to, I'll, I'll work as hard as I, I'll work down until such point as my wages look fair, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which, uh, which of course is something which helped to bring down the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, people could, you know, as Russians would say, well, they pretend to pay us, so we pretend to work. So class struggle was going on, even when, on the face of it, it couldn't go on because you would have just been killed. Uh, and even in repressive societies like Iran or whatever, as we see, class struggle hasn't gone away. He, he, you know, even in China after the Kuomintang defeat of, of Mao Zedong in the 20s, class struggle didn't go away. Mm. Last question then before I bring in people who've got their hands up now. Sorry, sorry, comrades. Um, is the question of ideology how how we overcome it or put in another word is ideology always a bad thing you know can it can it serve us in creating a working class state or a working class society you know a dictatorship of the proletariat i mean we'll need to create our own culture etc how are we going to do it without it being you know as tainted and as badly used for appropriate for the few, you know, against the the many. And so, is it would would there be a is there a good ideology or is it do we see that as a is it always a sort of negative I mean, thing? The, in the US, in the USSR, was certainly used in a in a bad way. I mean, I would argue that Marx's method is a scientific method uh, for 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 making transparent that which is currently opaque and. From that point of view, I mean, one can say that there's an ideological component to it. I think it's it's important to actually have these sorts of meetings. It's important to have these kind of conversations in trade union branches or whatever else. Um, from that point of view, you know, I've, I've got some sympathy with both Lenin and Luxembourg, and I think and Franz Jakubowski uh, similarly uh, cites both approvingly and and critically. Uh, I, I think. It, yes, it's it's in a sense our ideology, but it's but but I would argue that unlike um, the ideology of the bourgeoisie, uh, ours is amenable to some sort of test. Uh, our explanatory capacity to 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 show for you know if you cast your mind back to the the, the crash of two thousand and eight, if a few more people had been reading Capital, uh, they might have understood what was going on. Uh, I, even among the bourgeoisie, there's been some recognition of uh, there's an importance to the idea of the labor theory of value. And I can assure you, the good people of the Ukraine uh, will, will very soon understand the importance of the labor theory of value because six, what is it, between six and eight million people have left the country. There's not going to be an awful lot of value created there. Um, yes, ideology is, but ours is a scientific method to, to, to make social relations go from the opaque to the transparent thank you comrade okay i'm gonna shut up for a bit now and bring in speakers from the floor um i think the first one was ivana but you um ivana you need to uh, accept me making you into a panelist or i can just allow you to talk if you could just put in the chat how you'd prefer to do it 
Uh, in the meantime, I'm taking Sabi, please. Yes, so thank you very much. And, and thanks to Ian for um, a fascinating, comprehensive uh, uh, outline. Uh, just on the question of, Bre of Brexit, um, I think one argument for voting Remain, which persuaded me, was um, looking, was comparing it to um, Marx and Engels' position on German unification. They were in favor of German unification on the grounds that it would unite the German work, working class, even though it meant that a united Germany would be dominated by an autocratic Prussia. But for them, anything that united the working class was positive and progressive. And on the question of, 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 of our class ideology, and, and I think Ian's put forward some very uh, interesting and important ideas. I mean, there's on the face of it a contradiction, um, as, as I remember. On the one hand, Marx uh, or Engels say the ruling ideas of society are the ideas of the ruling class. On the other hand, they say um, that the working class is the subject of history. On the face of it, those two ideas are contradictory. But if we take uh, the example of the Russian Revolution and take a practical uh, historical example, what do we see that in the immediate aftermath of the uh, October Revolution, or, or actually just before, the Russian Soviets, which consisted of directly uh, elected uh, bodies of, of, of workers and peasants, they voted for a central committee of the Bolshevik party that consisted, I think, of a third of its, me of its members who were Jewish. Now, if you think about anti-Semitism in Tsarist Russia, and, you know, until the Holocaust, there was no worse country uh, of, of anti-Semitic, you know, anti-Semitism, regular pogroms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, how come that, you know, a new government is is elected um, by revolutionary workers and peasants, and they elected a, a, a government that had so many Jews in it? Something must have happened to the consciousness of those workers and peasants who had who had identified the real enemy, the Tsarist ruling class, the capitalist class, and they no longer needed. Jews to be scapegoats. So I think that's a very important example of the transformation of consciousness is, 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 is based on revolutionary, on, on class activity. And of course, just if I may, just one final example. Um, if you took the 1960s here, there was a very high level of trade union activity. And the 1960s was a, a decade of of great reforms, you know, think of all the great reforms that were carried in the 1960s, uh, abortion law, homosexual law reform, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think that that would not have, those reforms would not have been possible if not for the, for the grassroots activity uh, on the part of the trade unions. Whereas, you know, once you get Thatcher and the defeat of the miners, we're still suffering from the effects of the defeat of the miners, in my view, uh, uh, as a result of Thatcherism. Anyway, I'll leave you there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sabi. Do you want to reply to a few things, Ian? Oh, I agree with all that. That's great. Let's just get, get as many up from the floor as possible. Okay. Um, Ivana, if I think, do, do you want to speak? Or do you want me to speak? Yes, that would be better. I'm here with my puppy and he made a big mess, so like, <laughs> voice is better. Right. Uh, so um, I, I just want to, unfortunately, I missed the last uh, uh, comment because uh, I got kicked out. So I hope I'm not asking the same thing or like talking about the same thing. So uh, what I wanted to talk is I, I've uh, tried to learn more about Marxism and like uh, their ideolo ideology, but uh, having ADHD, reading a lot of bo books is very difficult. So I tend to have a lot of scattered information. What I have understood though is like, the way from what I read, there is something I believe is very feasible right now. And I would like to sort of share it with you guys to see if I, from an ideological point of view that makes sense or it doesn't. So my, my starting point is that the technology today allows us to communicate much more efficiently, even across borders. Right, and it's much easier to have an international movement of the working class today, potentially in terms of technology, to, uh, logistics, than it was at the time of, uh, say, Marx or, or Lenin. Um, what, like, I think we are missing is like we are at the level of alienation in which way we, we, we talk about work-life balance as if when you're working you're not leaving and it's something completely <laughs> external to your life and your life has to be put on hold when you're working and so I think people 
are all lost in the own little uh, cubicles, uh, but with a movement that tries to uh, help and free resources, I, I believe uh, it's possible to already build the grounds for a new democratic system because we could build around like local pods that meet face to face and inter interact and, co and coordinate uh, online. And that is very easy. The only problem is that from what I see it, what capital has done, they have managed to steal our time and energy from us. We are all short of time, short of energy, on the verge of, an, uh, of a nervous crisis, <laughs> a nervous, um, nervous breakdown all, all, all the time. And uh, uh, when, when you said about, when Ian, when you said about uh, the ideas about whether uh, the revolution can happen, uh, happen spontaneously without uh, a revolutionary context, uh, I feel the revolution, the most important part of the rev revolutionary context and like a revolutionary movement is that pooling resources together. Like I'm from Italy and the partisan movement that was largely like lefties, like a very big chunk was lefties. Um, they uh, shared everything. They, they shared incomes, they shared troubles. Like if there was someone that like they could free their hands so that they could fight, they would do that. Uh, but because of uh, the ideology of capitalism, we have internalized that concept that we can't ask for help, then we can't, we shouldn't take help because it's taking advantage, that people will take pity on us, and that uh, we are a failure if we don't, if, if we are taking help because it means we couldn't do it on our own. So I think that the, the, the most important thing to me is to ideologically fight <laughs> that and realize that socialism and solidarity they go both ways. It's not just the people have to realize that we can help them. We have to realize that we can help each other. And it starts from us. It starts from us creating that unity, the class consciousness and the revolutionary uh, framework where we can free our resources and time uh, by helping each other and not going to the market or to the establishment or to the government for assistance when we can help each other. Um, so that's what I am observing, and that's the reason why I think also the context is different to Lenin or, or Marx, also because the difference between like the percentages of the ruling class have become so tiny that we are the system. If you think about it, if like they are less than the 5% of the population, who's the system? <laughs> we are the system. We have to just forget all the ideology that they have told us, forget that it's bad to struggle, that it's bad to uh, you know, take help and start asking for help, not expecting it, but asking it and say like, you know, I could do a lot more politically, socially, if I didn't have the problem that I have some to have someone stay with my, my mom. Oh, I have my mom also here. Why don't you bring her here? I'll look after both of them and you can go and do the... The, the, the fighting. So I think that's what we have to try and do. And I wanted to see how that you think fits within the ideological frameworks that we have discussed. Thank you very much, comrade. Um, just a quick one before Ian comes in. I think we are we are the majority, but we're not the system. I think uh, once the majority starts to get organized, you'll quickly see what the system will do to try and stop us. Eh? They have the army, they have the police, they have the state force behind them. And I think that's that's where things will get a bit tricky and where we have to, you know, we, the bottom up approach will will be tested severely. But, you know, in, in general, of course, I, I, I agree with you. But um, Ian, what do you think? Uh, perhaps address both uh, Savi and Ivana, uh, just so I don't forget stuff. Although I do make notes as I go along. I mean, Savi, you're absolutely right. And of course, the, 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 the Soviets themselves were, were not invented by the Bolsheviks, they were spontaneous uh, themselves. Uh, but at the same time, of course, needed uh, some kind of political direction. Whether that was subsequently lost and subverted is, of course, a question of debate. You're right as well, of course, about the, the reforms of the 1960s. I mean, I. I remember before we joined the European Union, I was born in 61, and, and many of the reforms that took place in the 1960s were obviously very welcome, and, and didn't just weren't, just, weren't just free gifts, people fought for them, 
and from that point of view, uh, and and learn from. But also, of course, um, learn from the defeats. Uh, but I wish we'd learned a bit better from the defeats. Um, and of course, you, you, you're right when you were saying about Marx and, and German unification. I, I look forward to Sabi giving us a, a talk at some point. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Ivana, as well, you're absolutely right about technology. And I thought this is, this is one of the things. On the, on the face of it, if you look at our, our situation at the moment, it's, it's, it's terrible. We don't, you know, we, we've got, um, where are all those workers that would have previously been socialized in factories? Well, they're all on Zoom calls or something. Uh, but on the other hand, work is truly internationalized. Uh, you know, you can't buy anything that isn't made from uh, all over the world. And of course, but what we're currently facing, of course, is the threat against China in, in no small part because the possibility that uh, the you know the United States' dependence upon microprocessors created in Taiwan and any possible threat to Taiwan is a threat to the entire capitalist system. Um, so the, the interrelationship, and of course, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, 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 we are atomized, and things like depression and anxiety have become individual personal problems rather than a, a, a feature of human alienation, as, as we might understand it. Although I recognize there are biological factors as well. But of course, those are biological factors themselves are the result of um, social, social factors and uh, historical factors and the fact that our our biology isn't something which is um, fixed, it is itself uh, amenable to, to change. Um, and I think there is a, the, the basis for a, for a, a new system and of a, of a of a cooperative way in which workers can can help one another. And the state, of course, as as, uh, as Tina has pointed out, is, is going to be crucially important in all of this. I mean, the, 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 we can't underestimate the sheer power that the state can exert. Um, but yes, more from the floor, I think. Thank you, Ian. Um, Steve, please. Are you mute, Steve? Yes, yeah, so I, I didn't mute myself, so Tina then went to unmute me by muting me. That's what happens, I think. So <laughs> Anyway, we're going around in circles. Um, yeah, thanks, Ian, for your talk. Really, really um, comprehensive and, and um, excellent talk. But I thought I might illustrate some of the themes that you had in your talk with my own example. And the example I was thinking of, and Tina could comment on this, is the example of um, the crown versus Tony Greenstein or the crown versus Julian Assange. Because we, and Tina can give us, everybody on this meeting to know about Tony's case. I'm sure Tina will mention it, the details of that later. So I thought I'll just work in there. And I was thinking about this. Well. Okay, well, what the hell's the crown then? Well, uh, first, first answer to that, what is the crown? Uh, could be, uh, well, it's a thing, that, like a golden hat or a helmet that you put on your head. You know, and the warriors used to put these hats on their head, like Charlemagne had one of these helmets, golden helmet put on his head. So in the first sight, the crown appears to be a thing. You might say, well, this is commodity fetishism, therefore thinking that there's something happening there. And then your next answer, the next answer might be, well, the crown is a person, an individual like King Charles III or Queen Elizabeth II. So it now appears not to be a thing anymore, but now appears to be a person. So that's something slightly different. But I think that doesn't get to it either. I think we have to go, as you said, Ian, that the crown is a social relationship between people between master and servant, between master and subject. The crown, therefore, is a social power, a political power of the state to rule over us. Uh, where does that political power come from, therefore? We have to ask ourselves, which is the next step. Well, does it come from the ownership of land? Is some sort of feudal relationship? No, no, it doesn't. It comes, crown power in its modern form is the power of the political power of capital the City of London, the corporations, HM Treasury, the Bank of England, and value hundreds of billions of pounds, which the crown can command, which, of course, has come from the working class. 
So it comes from those relationships of uh, exploitation and surplus value. So the question is, what is false consciousness then? False consciousness is to think that the crown is a golden helmet or to think that the crown is an individual person like King Charles III, to think that the crown is some sort of feudal landed property and not to understand that the crown is none of these things, but the political form taken by capital in the, in the British state. It's a relationship of domination and oppression over the working class. So in that sense, we have to take all this stuff seriously. If we're going to construct a radical and democratic politics, we have to look behind these things that appear in a mystified form to us and understand the social relationships. I suppose the king's in the superstructure seat and the working class is in the base, I guess. But I think that's, that's I've tried, using that example. So Tony Greenstein is not facing a blibbing hat. He's not even facing King Charles III when he comes to court. He's actually facing the power of the crown and all the power of the state, which is about to lock him up. Um, possibly, hopefully not, obviously, but, and obviously that's the reason why Tina's going to remind us what we can do to support him in as she sums up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stu. Ian, do you want to... Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll over the floor, I'll come back to it. Okay, we've got um, Gary, please, if you could switch on your camera. There you are. Thanks, Tina. Uh, so I, I've not got a contribution. I just wanted to ask a question of Ian, actually. So I was intrigued by the, the allusions that you made to the criticisms that so-called Western Marxists raised after the failure of the revolutions, uh, uh, suggesting a, a loss of recognition of the importance of dialectics uh, in 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 Len Lenin and the Bolsheviks, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about that because I, I wasn't aware of that of that criticism. Um, I find that intriguing. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Do you want to come in on that, Ian? I'll I'll, I'll try and round a few up together. There's, there's only one more uh, person with a hand up. So if you and uh, she's Diana, do you want to uh, uh, switch on your camera, please, Diana? Or you can just uh, no because um Sorry. I'm ill in bed, so I don't okay. want to be Sorry to hear that, comrade. We can hear you uh, now, so you can you can oh, speak. All right, you want me to um yeah. With respect to um the Brexit vote, um if I vote voted on ideological grounds, I would have um said none of the above. Um because the the uh, the EU is um, is a sort of uh, hyper capitalist uh, corporate run um, establishment, and out out of the EU, um, we've got it's even worse here than the EU. So, just just for um, pragmatic reasons, I thought we were better off staying in, and I still think so. But I don't blame anyone for voting to get out because very good reasons to do that um what's it oh yeah um with respect to uh, nuclear war um and and the, the the war in ukraine i don't know what people there are too many people swallowing um the uh bourgeois propaganda that we're being inundated with all the time. There is a difference between the Russian side and the NATO side. Um, and it was the it was the Russian communists who uh, who actually pushed and pushed and pushed over years to get um, military action taken to protect the people in the Donbass the working class people in the Donbass that were being uh, attacked uh, by the fascists, or actually Van Dyke Nazis, that, Na that uh, the CIA, NATO, put into power. Um, so 
you know, um, the the Russian system has uh, you know got it got its uh, flaws and un undoubtedly, but but um, what was the, how were the people of the Donbass to be protected if the, if Russia hadn't taken action? They would just they would just have been annihilated. There would have been a complete genocide, and yeah, and, and it's true. The millions of people have left Ukraine. Four million of them um, have gone to Russia. Um, and I liked um, Ivana's idea of democracy too, but it sounds very similar to what Cuba actually has. Um, it, it's worth uh, actually examining the type of the, the bits of democracy that Cuba actually has. Again, our um, propaganda tells us that Cuba is, uh, is, is ruled by despots. This is not, it's under, just like Russia has been under siege for hundreds of years, particularly after the um, 1917 revolution. Cuba is, is viciously under siege, under siege. And when you've got um, a nation under siege, uh, it does not exactly um, in, in, inspire the most, uh, it, um, how can I put it? Governments will, t will, uh, will come down hard on anyone they think is, going, is, is infiltrating and trying to overthrow that, that country. And the US and NATO have been in, intervening in country after country to, to trash it. Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, um, Libya, the, la the latest one is Ukraine. And uh, Cuba has been viciously un un under, under siege since, um, since 1959. Um, what's there, uh, anything else I was going to say? Uh, I think that covers all I wanted to say, actually. So I could well, wind up. <laughs> okay. thank, you. thank you, Diana. Um, thank you. And um, we've got nobody with their hands up. Um, Felicity's asked a couple of questions in the Q and A. I don't know, um, Ian, if you managed to see them. If not, I'll just read them out. I'm um, not sure they're entirely relevant to, relevant to this session, but I'll ask them anyway. I think they'll some of them will come up in the following sessions. First one is. Um, what impact will the existential issue of climate degradation change have on Marxist theories? We do have a couple of sessions coming up uh, on Marx and nature. I think that probably might be better answered there. Um, <clears throat> could the progress of IE, uh, sorry, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, impede the advent of socialism? That's a that's a that's a big question. Um, and then also, um, what? What and is the influence of MEPs such as Claire Daly? Um, and I think that sort of that that sort of touches on our counter ideology. I what what can we do to oppose the ideology of the ruling class? And that's you know doing what we're doing here is putting on meetings like this, educating ourselves, propaganda, you know, writing newspapers of the left, putting out our messages as opposed to their messages, and and. Certainly, Claire Daly is a, is a wonderful um, speaker um, who opposes the war on, on Ukraine and, and lots of other things. And she is brilliant in the Euro European Parliament. So she's a sort of a counterculture, you know, ideologue, if you like. Um, so there's, there's nobody with a hand up. Ian, if you would like to wrap that all up into a nice, neat package <laughs> or just go through it one by one. Sure. Thank you, comrades. I mean, I, I, I don't have any kind of passionate disagreements with anybody really there, but, but we'll come to a couple of things. Firstly, on the crown, um, and the crown isn't a thing, it's a social relationship, just as a, a president is, in a sense, a social relationship. If, if, it, if it were not, the, I mean, in a sense, I think it would be a huge step in the right direction if Britain were to become a republic. But I'm under no illusions about what that president would be like. And, and I think, for the most part, things like the, you can, one can see the crown almost as a, in part, 
a relationship to the state. I, you know, the, it's not an accidental that the, the soldiers have the crown on their cap badges or on their shoulders and uh, with the rank of major or staff sergeant or whatever else. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I think an, another important feature of, of ideology is that effectively we become our own slave driver. Uh, you know, unlike under feudalism, we actually, you know, you actually get people who worry about not going to work or get anxious because they're not doing their job because they've been criticised at work because they're not fully gnarled enough. Or, um, so I don't, you know, I, I'm completely in agreement with Steve Freeman, we need to do away with the crown, but let's not have any illusions about, I mean, uh, when Marx was arguing for democratic republics, he was arguing for the, for a political formation that would be the best way for workers to organise, rather than under conditions of autocracy, where, for example, socialist parties were, were made illegal. And, but, it, but in a sense that, you know, I think we could do away with the crown tomorrow and it still, still wouldn't bring about socialism. It would be a step in the right direction and I'd be in favour of it. But, um, Gary, the, the, the criticism uh, launched by people like Franz Jakubowski and, and others in the, what comes to be known as the, the Western Marxist tradition influenced by the Frankfurt School. Um, Karl Korsch was hugely influential on Jakubowski and so was um, um, Lukács. I think for a long time under Stalinism, I don't think it was necessarily a feature of the early period of, of the Soviet Union. But for a long time under Stalinism, things like any kind of discussion of human nature was was effectively suppressed. You have a, you had a situation where, I mean, because one sees it in Althusser, for example, an idea that there's no such thing as human nature, there's only historically specific human nature. We, you think we like, I mean, but I don't think that was Marx's view. And there's a nice little footnote to that effect in, in volume one of Capital. So in other words, the, the Hegelian part of Marx was consigned to the, as far as the Stalinists were concerned, was consigned to the, the, the early period, the economic and philosophic manuscripts and those kinds of things. Um, and it was a, just a, 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 as I say, a, a, like a salad dressing, something. What those of the Western Marxist tradition have done, whatever their failings, whatever their, whatever misgivings we might have about them. I mean, if you think of Erich Fromm, for example, or, you know, um, of, on whom uh, Sadi is, a, is, a, is an expert. If you think of Eric Fromm, one of his great contributions, whatever you think of his approach to psychoanalysis, one of his great contributions is he, he managed to repopularize the idea of um, Marx's conception of human nature. The, 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 the Western Marxist tradition at least had that aim to, to rescue dialectics and to rescue the notion of of, of Marxism as, a, as an ontological project to make humanity truly human. Um, um, so I, just to anybody who thinks I was, I'm somehow defending the European Union, uh, I'm, I'm not. And uh, I think one of the reasons why a lot of people voted to leave the European Union, for example, was the disgraceful way that the Greece was treated. You know, there's the, the Greek bourgeoisie wrecking the Greek economy. And there's the European Union insisting that the Greek working class has to pay for it. Uh, of course, uh, you know, but but that's the argument that we should be having at the time in terms of putting forward a, a, a different perspective on the European Union, on, of, of, in favour of doing away with all nation states, not just European ones. Um, and from that point of view, I'm in favour of the United States of the world. But, um, in, in that context at that time, I think it would have been worth having that debate around a, a, a slogan for Socialist United States of Europe rather than fighting between Lexit or, or you know, or just abstaining or something or plague on both your houses. Because I think it's had direct consequences. It's been a carnival of reaction ever since uh, and has given a huge boost to nationalist movements all over the place. Um, and from that point of view, I think Brexit has been a bit of a disaster for working people, quite apart from uh, the decline in standards of living and availability of things and, um, and, and the ability to work wherever you want. Um, <clears throat> a bit about 
Nazis and fascists and whatever in in Russia. I, I, as pe people who know me, will know, I'm a little bit more cautious about using the term Nazi or fascist. I remember when um, Yugoslavia was being carved up, there was a tendency to regard Franjo Tudjman, for example, and, and all the symbolism he had around the, the Ustashi symbolism, uh, the Ustashi regime, which was a puppet regime under the Nazis in, in Croatia. And the idea was that, you know, Franjo Tudjman was a Nazi, Franjo Tudjman was a fascist. Well, actually, what he was, was a kind of logical expression of, a, of, of what comes out of Stalinism. What you end up with is, a, is, a, is an extreme nationalism. And if it takes the symbolism of, 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 of fascist organisations like the Ustashi, and similarly, I mean, I'm under no illusions about the disgusting nature of some of the people who are active in both U Ukraine and in Russia in terms of their right-wing nationalist perspective and what they're likely to do to ordinary working people if they ever could take power. Uh, but at the same time, I think one of Trotsky's great contributions was, was placing fascism and the Nazis in a particular context. And that context doesn't necessarily pertain um, in Russia or Ukraine and isn't terribly helpful, I don't think. I mean, what I see in Putin, if anything, is a continuation of Stalinism by, another, by other means, but with capitalist relations of production, albeit in a bizarre and distorted form as one might expect of a, of a capitalism in decline, but also um, to a certain extent of great Russian chauvinism, which never went away. And I particularly liked um, Sabi's comment about the way in which the Soviets quite spontaneously, well, whether it was completely spontaneous or whether they'd been actually learning stuff from well-educated cadres. And it's interesting how some historically some of the best educated workers were, of course, um, print printers because they could read um and and you know learning that uh, to divide people along whether they're jewish or black or whatever is 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 just a way of dividing the working class while the ruling class laughs all the way to the bank um so um i, I i'm, I'm not going to particularly defend cuba as a socialist haven uh, like all uh, forms of stalinist organization it has no kind of mature form, but I would at the same time point out that um, the average life expectancy of people in Cuba is, is greater than that in the United States. And from a, a massively impoverished country, a country impoverished by the United States, from that point of view, uh, I would oppose uh, an imperialist intervention in Cuba without necessarily feeling the need to defend um, the Cuban regime. Um, and uh, I think the whole business around climate, as regards artificial intelligence, I'm, I'm sorry, I simply don't know enough. Um, around climate de degeneration, I think is absolutely crucial. I mean, we we, um, we can't know the effect that it's going to have. What I would say though is, we think about some historical parallels, perhaps um, the arrival of malaria in um, the Roman Empire, uh, particularly in mainland Italy. Um, played a huge part in weakening the Roman Empire and leading to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. It was a feature. It wasn't the only feature. Remember what I was talking about in terms of the interpenetration of accident and necessity in history. It was a it was a feature of uh, that, that was just one more thing that in a system that was already in decline. And we can say the same about the Black Death in the 14th century. The Black Death in reducing the population by about a third throughout Europe gave a huge impact, gave a huge impetus to workers being able to demand freedom from the land. It had a huge impact in ending feudalism. Um, whether COVID uh, or the next pandemic or COVID AIDS and the next pandemic, COVID AIDS, the next war, and the next pandemic, um, has a similar impact in shortening the life of capitalism remains to be seen. I think the task as communists is to, to recognise that capitalism is already a bloodbath and therefore to try and end capitalism um, in, is, is, a, is a question of just trying to save as many human lives as, as absolutely possible. Um, 
I think I've covered all of that, have I? Um, if I've missed anything, what did you say? Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, comrades, for joining us. Uh, it's an interesting session. Sorry, I was engaged in, a, in an online chat there, which was also very um, vibrant today and very, uh, very lively, um, which is always good. It's always a good sign when comrades get involved, etc. Um, so just to clarify, I mean, this series, we are coming from different traditions, the people who are organizing this series, um, but we do share the view that Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, and the early socialists in particular, helped to shape ideas, helped to shape a, a concept of what the working class is, and crucially, the role of the working class in overthrowing capitalism. And that's what sort of, you know, helped us put this series together. And it's the reason why we why we wanted to have a closer look at these ideas. I'm saying this because in the chat, there's been there's been quite a lively discussion about, um, you know, um, doing something a bit different without saying you know we're socialists or without saying we're Marxists etc but I think I think most of us would be of the opinion that it is Marx and Engels had a lot to teach us and a lot of it has been forgotten and a lot of, uh, out of it has been pushed aside and we want to rediscover some of these ideas and we want to rediscuss uh, collectively although we are coming from different traditions we're not a particular trend of some sort um, we believe we can go forward together um, by discussing, by disagreeing, by sometimes agreeing on various issues. I hope that that sort of clarifies a little bit where we're coming from. But we're all socialists, and we we think you know the Marxist, the Marxist method is is the method that is needed today to inform the working class of how it can become the ruling class and <clears throat> take all issues of seriously, take all issues of politics seriously. Is it the state, the law, etc., which is brings me neatly to, to the Tony Greenstein case. Uh, I'm not uh, entirely up to date. I think Ian might, 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 fill me, might be able to fill us in a little bit as well because he's just written an article um, which I've posted in the chat earlier on, which uh, comrades should read. I'll put it there again. So Tony um, and his comrades haven't actually done anything. They were on the way perhaps to some something um, or other and they were caught and they were trialed and the crucialest thing is they they were not allowed to speak in court about what happened and they were not allowed to speak about what their what their motivation was their political motivation that was ruled out of order by by the judge which is a very new very serious development that you're not allowed to to talk about justification um so all, all they were allowed to talk about is the abc you know there's a there was a car etc cetera, etc cetera. Which of course is hugely um, that detrimental to the to the to the defendant to to defend themselves. Why why did I do what I did? Or in this case, planning to do perhaps because they hadn't actually done anything. So this is a huge attack on our rights and our civil liberties. It's a huge attack on the right of juries. You know to be to be um, to be judged by a, a jury of your peers. If your peers are not allowed to hear what you did, why you did it, etc. So it's it's a huge political case he's political you know these are political prisoners soon perhaps because the judgment will be um the, the sentencing will take place on june the 26th in wolverhampton 10 a.m if comrades are able to go along um and show their solidarity to to tony and the other five other four defendants who will be sentenced that day that would be quite useful and um, we're trying to put on a zoom meeting with with tony and a few other comrades who can inform us but also um discuss these issues uh taking place it's it's not really been um discussed much which is quite shocking in the sort of bourgeois media they're totally ignoring it but this has been a, a, a quite a big change in terms of the jury system it's a huge attack on the jury system that you are not allowed to tell the jury why you you know did what you did or were planning to do um ian do you know anything else that might be useful for um, comrade it's just that the in the past so for example when they, they threw edward colston's statue in the in the in the bristol docks the defense could say well um firstly the european human convention on human rights allows uh, people to protest and the defense of private property of course is central to bourgeois law however the laws shouldn't be so intrusive as to prevent people from protesting and so effectively what 
the outcome of that has been is that uh, Cruella de Vil, uh, Brahman, um has uh, ensured that the law lords have, have clarified things that will make it much more difficult to say that criminal damage can be defended. In the context of what we might call the Shenston Six, um, the defence is that, and historically this has been a, a defence, you, you can commit a crime to commit a worse, to prevent a worse one. In the case of uh, the attack upon Elbit Systems, which is Israel's biggest armaments manufacturer, and is making the engines and, and the, the plant that was um, allegedly um, targeted uh, was making the engines for the drones that are killing Palestinians every day. So on the one hand, you have what's recognised by some in the UN as being a, a process of, uh, of um, ethnic cleansing. Uh, you know, I seem to recall that we were pretty cross about ethnic cleansing when it was uh, argued that it was being carried out by Serbs. But it seems that it's very different when it's being carried out against uh, people with brown skin in Palestine. And um, ethnic, so the, the, the defence was prevented from, from defend that de that defence was prevented. The idea that, and of course, um, Palestine Action has actually been quite successful in, in being acquitted in the past uh, when they daubed um, Elbit uh, Systems headquarters in London um, with red paint to symbolise the blood of the Palestinians. They were acquitted at Southwark Crown Court. But uh, the judge, and I think it's very clear that the state is, is, is particularly since Colston, but there have been other examples as well, where each a, attempt on the part of a jury to exercise its conscience is now being prevented. Um, so uh, despite the fact that, uh, you know, since 1670, the independence of the jury to find an unjust law uh, to be unjust and therefore acquit someone on the basis of their conscience it, it has been it has been summarily undermined um and this is just the tip of the iceberg for what we've got to look forward to in the future yeah indeed so uh, comrades we'll keep you updated um by the llla in particular because uh, it's not really the remit of this this series but the llla will be putting out more information about uh, any meetings with Tony, et cetera, we can pull together. There is a meeting in Brighton on June the 13th, um, but it's a bit far away from, from most comrades and I don't think they're streaming it, but they are looking into it. So we'll we'll let you know as soon as we have any more details. And of course, that is a that is a prime example of, of the role of ideology and how under threat, you know, the state when it's under threat, when it doesn't want to have to deal with these kind of increasing numbers, as Ian says, increasing numbers of uh, juries actually letting off people. Um, you know, they have clearly done something, but the jury thought it was justified and they let them off. Hugely embarrassing from, from a sort of, the, you know, the state's point of view that they're, they're suing these people, they're putting them in court, and then the jury says, nah, it's fine. It's fine to do all of that, to have that um, opposition work. So this is a, clearly a, a, a way of, you know, the, the role of ideology is, is clearly to see um, in, 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 in this case, and we have to oppose it vig uh, vigorously. So comrades, uh, join us next week when we're doing a, a session on Marx and money, and that's with Rob Gold and uh, John Holiday. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Ian. Great session. Thank you, everybody. And we see you next week. Bye-bye.